So we'll start. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, just give me one minute. Please. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. This is Pursue 14H which is Hematology, General and Fundamental, and we are streaming live from PGI Chandigarh via Kolkata. We have a very, very interesting, very relevant, and very important topic today, systematic approach to evaluation of bone marrow aspiration, technique and approach. A very important topic, and to talk on that, we have somebody who is very well accomplished, very learned, and an expert in hematology. We have Dr. Navajit Malik, as you can see, he's an MBBS from the famous Seth GS Medical College and KM Hospital, Mumbai. After which he did, he did his M MD Pathology from the famous Ram Manohar Loya Hospital, New Delhi. His senior residency from the Department of Laboratory Oncology from the famous Ames, New Delhi. And then added on to that, he did his DM Hematopathology from PGI Chandigarh. So he has got all the flowers and the feathers in his cap. And right now he is the assistant professor in the department of hematology at PGI Chandigarh with interest in flow cytometry in benign and malignant hematological disorders, erythrocytosis. He's got multiple publications in national and international journals. Before I ask Dr. Malik to start, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off, and please at no point do not share your screen, please. With this, let me request Dr. Navajit Malik, sir. Please share your screen and let us start the show. Let me share the screen. I hope the screen is visible, sir. Uh, not yet. Yeah, it's now visible, right? You can make it full screen, please. It's full screen. Okay, fine. Please start. Thank you Dr. Nadeem for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction, uh, kind introduction and uh, I'd also like to thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk on this very important topic as you said, a uh, systematic approach to bone marrow aspirate. Now this is also a very vast topic uh, and uh, JRs in uh, medicine uh, who are doing JR in uh, pathology uh, all over the country would think that this is what they do uh, all of their three years. Most work in hematology for uh, JRs in pathology is related to bone marrow aspirate and bone marrow biopsy viewing. So let's see uh, how, to, how to go about it. We are not really going to uh, learn entire pathology here. What we are going to do is how to uh, systematically approach both the procedure and the evaluation of a bone marrow and what exact questions should we ask when we uh, see a bone marrow aspirate film, when we see a certain uh, components of the bone marrow aspirate and when we see certain cells in a bone marrow aspirate. What is the question that should be in our mind? So uh, the layout for this topic would be first we'll cover some interesting historical aspects, then we uh, address the important question why bone marrow examination should be done. Then we'll go on to the procedure and interpretation and finally see how a report of a bone marrow aspirate should be. So trefine biopsy is what we call this uh, biopsy, right? And what is trefine? Trefine is a surgical instrument with cylindrical blade used to obtain a cylindrically shaped core of bone. And trepanning is the process which from which the word trefine is, uh, comes. Is trepanning is a surgical procedure in which a hole is drilled into the skull. 
So now trepanning is one of the oldest procedures known to humans and skulls of 8,000 or 10,000 years old have shown evidence of medical intervention uh, which have been found in Europe and all across the world actually. And this has been used to relieve headaches, mental illness and in ancient times possibly to release uh, spirits. So here you can see a skull from uh, around 8,000 years old which was found in Northern Africa which has these, uh, both, uh, these holes in their skull which was uh, by the process of trepanning. So, ground refines that was used in the earlier, uh, as we saw in this skull, was used as late as 1700s for therapeutic measures. And in fact, what we call as a verbal surgery today is just modification of that, but not for diagnostic use. So, when was it started for diagnostic? So, first attempts to obtain a bone marrow sample by uh, surgical refine was undertaken in the year 1903. So, early 20th century was when uh, bone marrow was uh, started for diagnostic purposes. Uh, in 1920s, it, uh, the first procedure was done on the femur. In 1920s, uh, people went on to the sternum, tibia, and in the 1950s, the pelvis was tested as the source of bone marrow examination. However, bone marrow examination as a popular diagnostic method became popular only after the 60s with the advent of the Wim Silverman biopsy needle, which was used by McFarland and Temeshek. In 1971, uh, the famous uh, Jamshidi, whose Jamshidi needle we all know about, was a citizen of Iran. He patented his needle, and this design allowed tissue to freely enter the lumen and avoid crushing of the tissue. So, good quality tissue was obtained, and bone marrow examination became very popular after this. So, now the question why bone marrow examination? Answers are very simple. Bone marrow is a very important and the major site of metabolism in the body. It is also an important element of the reticular endothelial system. If you take uh, what is the production of a uh, bone marrow, so per kg bone uh, body weight, daily average production of the bone marrow is around 2.5 billion red cells, 1 billion granulocytes and 2.5 billion platelets, so huge numbers. And that is not all, it also has a huge reserve capacity. It can produce 5 to 10 times more if required in the times of stress. So we know that a bone is made of cortex and medulla. And the medulla has a honeycomb cancellous bone. Its interstices form the medullary cavity and contain the bone marrow. Now, bone marrow occupies the cavities of, of about 85% of the skeletal system. It weighs between 1600 and 3700 grams in a normal adult. And its distribution is very importantly age dependent. So, what does that mean? In a neonate, virtually the entire bone marrow cavity is fully occupied by proliferating hematopoietic cells, which is called as a red bone marrow. Right? But by early adult life, the hematopoietic bone marrow is only limited to the skull, vertebrae, ribs, clavicle, sternum, pelvis and the proximal half of the humerus and femur. So here is a picture uh, representation of this. You can see the bone and where the bone marrow is located in the medullary cavity. This is just a picture of the hematopoiesis and we are not going to get into the detail of this. We know that hematopoiesis occurs from the hematopoietic stem cells. We have the early or the uh, Long-term hematopoietic stem cells, which go out to the short-term hematopoietic stem cells, which go out to the multipotent progenitors, and they divide into the common myeloid and the common lymphoid uh, progenitors. I just put this uh, graph to show that the paradigms are slowly changing. This is what we thought was always happening, that there is a stepwise progression, but now we know that they are myeloid-biased and lymphoid-biased hematopoietic stem cells. So stem cells can provide, uh, produce both myeloid and lymphoid progenitors. The, the ones are their genetically programmed to uh, produce both. They are producing usually one at one time, but if, uh, in times of stress and in times of need, the myeloid bias can also produce the lymphoid progenitors, and the lymphoid bias can also produce the myeloid progenitors. So the paradigm, so the paradigm of hematopoiesis is slowly changing, and we are getting to learn a lot. So, what are the components of the bone marrow now? So, the bone marrow uh, does not only have the hematopoietic tissue; it also has the bone, which is the cortex of a dense bone. And it also has a stroma, very importantly, because the stroma releases all the growth factors which is required for the hematopoiesis that we saw in the previous slides. The stroma has vessels, reticulin and fibroblasts, and adipose tissue. And the hematopoietic components are the granulocytic series, erythroid series, megarocytic series, lymphocytes, plasma cells, mast cells, and macrophages. What are the indications of bone marrow examination? Too broadly, it is diagnosis and disease monitoring. Although bone marrow and uh, aspiration and biopsy techniques are safe, they should be performed with a clear idea as to why are we going to do this bone marrow examination. We should have an idea beforehand and uh, just not do a bone marrow examination blindly. Because in many hematological disorders, such as say, iron deficiency anemia, thalassemia, acquired and inherited hematic anemias, 
only the examination of blood and specialized laboratory test is sufficient to make a diagnosis without the need of a bone marrow examination. So we should be clear in our head why we are going to do a bone marrow examination. Now this is a paper uh, that was published in the IJLH, which is basically the ICSH guidelines for standardization of bone marrow uh, sampling and reporting. And this states the various in, uh, investigations and indications for the bone marrow uh, examination. Uh, these are uh, variable, uh, various myriad uh, indications. Let's go on to the common ones. So uh, let's see a PGI pre pandemic, that was the year 2019, we did around 3200 adult bone marrows and around 770 pediatric bone marrows. What were the common indications? So most common indication was acute leukemias, followed by check marrow. Check marrow is what the term we use here for basically uh, the follow-up marrows of acute leukemias. So acute leukemias and their follow-ups constitute nearly one-third of all the bone marrows that was happening in uh, in our institute. This is followed by cytopenias, non vascular lymphomas, plasma cell dysplasias and the rest. So if we take a uh, look at in the tabular manner, so acute leukemias and their follow-ups, non-vascular lymphomas, plasma cell dysplasias, these are this form of major bulk, followed by cytopenias of unknown origin, uh, aplastic anemias, myeloproctic neoplasms and uh, such. But you have to be aware that this also depends, the indication also depends on the kind of center that you are placed in. So uh, because PGI is a tertiary center and all tertiary centers which have a good uh, oncology unit, they will have a lot of acute leukemias and a lot of uh, neoplastic um, indications for bone marrows. However, many centers might not be so. Uh, smaller centers where I have worked before do not have uh, so many malignancies as indications for bone marrow. So typically in a tertiary center you will have these kind of indications like acute leukemias and uh, non hospital lymphomas, plasma cell dysplasia, myeloproliferative neoplasms, etc. Whereas in smaller centers, the commoner indications are cytopenias, aplastic anemias, ITP and DUO or the pyrexia of unknown origin. So let's go to BMA, uh, see what are the advantages of BMA. So bone marrow aspirate has the main advantage that it's the best suited for morphological evaluation because it gives wonderful cytological details which the bone marrow biopsy cannot give. It also has the advantage that a wide variety of cytochemical stains can be applied on this sample. It is highly useful for leukemia diagnosis and for uh, anemia uh, diagnosis because of evaluation of iron stores. It is very useful for to see, uh, to see treatment response in acute leukemias. And very, very importantly, especially in this uh, today's age, that samples for ancillary tests, that is flow cytometry and cytometry, etc., can be taken only from the bone marrow aspirate. Of course, it is much less, less painful than the bone marrow biopsy. What are the disadvantages? The main disadvantage is that it does not really give a good estimate for cellularity. It does give uh, some uh, estimate as we'll discuss later, but not really a very good uh, estimate. Biopsy is much better for that. And it does not give information on bone marrow topography. It may not detect disease showing patchy infiltration. So, for example, uh, non hodgkin lymphomas, myelomas, and metastasis uh, uh, from uh, some other side to the bone marrow, they might not involve the whole of the bone marrow. So doing a bone marrow aspirate, we might miss a site in which these uh, infiltrations are present and that is why BMA might not be a very good uh, technique for this. And of course, it is very useless in the situations of dry tap where we are not even getting a sample at all. Right, so with that background, let's move on to the bone marrow aspirate procedure. So what are the prerequisites? The first main important prerequisite is a bone marrow procedure form which has a lot of details. Uh, I'll share with you the bone marrow recognition form that we have here at PGI and we have of course the initial uh, identification uh, files of the patient followed by the clinician details also and a very big space for clinical data and the history. Other than that, we also ask direct questions like, has the patient received any blood transfusions? Is he a hematnix? Uh, how, uh, how is the examination? Is, is he well built? Uh, does he have pallor? Does he have gum hyperplasia? So these are questions that we need to ask before doing a bone marrow examination. Because while evaluating, these informations are very, very essential. We also must know if there is any lymphadenopathy or not, if there is any hepatosplenomegaly or not, and what is the status of this uh, the nervous system and the cardiovascular system. Right. Other than that, has there any recent hemogram been done? Has there any radiological investigations been done? Any cytological investigations? Any histopathological investigations? And has there been a previous bone marrow examination of these patients? So a lot of information should be provided to us uh, before going on to do a bone marrow examination. And of course, the, the uh, doctor who is ordering this test should give his name and signature and also the phone number so that they may be contacted in case we have some deficiency in the data that has been provided to us. 
Now what are the supplies? So usually it is performed in a clinic or a bedside. So we have to take all our supplies there and ensure that everything is present at the time of the examination and that we are not falling short of it while a bone marrow examination is going, uh, going on. So let's uh, see what uh, supplies are required and what purpose are they required for. So we have to obtain a written consent. So we need ballpoint pens, clipboard and patient consent forms. For the preparation of a site, we need alcohol, we need betadine, we need gauze pieces, we need uh, gloves, sterile gloves and non-sterile gloves. We need injection lignocaine, we need needles of 22 gauge and we need fenestrated drape sheets for, for the marrow procedure procurement. Uh, procurement. We need uh, bone marrow aspiration needles, 15G or 16G. We usually perform six, uh, use 16 uh, gauge uh, needles for adults and 18G for pediatric bone marrow aspirant. We need disposable plastic syringes uh, of 10 ml and 20 ml. We need vacutainers, various vacutainers for all the samples that we need to take. And we need microscopic slides. And that after when the procedure has been complete, for the wound care, we need bandage scissors and we need bandage tape. First point is meeting the patient. So when you're meeting the, uh, when you're meeting the patient, first thing is to confirm the identification of the patient that is the same patient for whom the bone marrow uh, request has been sent. Uh, introduce the marrow team to the patient, make him comfortable. Minimize the patient anxiety. A basic description of the procedure should be uh, given to the patient uh, at that time. And if he has any questions, you should answer the questions and uh, allay his fears. A written handout may also be provided. And written consent form is to be signed by the patient before the, uh, the examination is done. It is very important to know that no, under no circumstances should a bone marrow procedure be performed without a written consent. Now, in the bedside preparation, we need to prepare the vacutainers uh, for special studies like flow cytometry, uh, cytogenetics, molecular studies. If we have to do microbiological cultures, then we need the culture bottles ready and label them. The slides should be cleaned and placed, uh, placed uh, ready for uh, smear preparation. And disposable syringes should also be there. And very importantly, inspect the bone marrow aspiration needle for manufacturing defects. It sounds silly here, but if you are opening a, a, a bone marrow aspiration needle and while the, the patient has been uh, prepared for the examination and you find that there is some defect in the needle, it causes a lot of embarrassment. So, site for bone marrow examination. As we read earlier, the hematopoietically active bone marrow is distributed throughout the skeleton in children, but it is restricted to the axial bones in adults. So, the posterior iliac crest is the optimal location for more marrow procurement for the reasons of comfort, safety and ease of performance. It is usually taken from the posterior superior iliac spine. And alternate sites can be uh, accessed if the posterior iliac crest is diseased or inaccessible because of morbid obesity or inability to properly position the patients. Sometimes the patients have some scar there and uh, then again uh, it becomes difficult for uh, marrow to be done from there. So alternate sites have to look for. So here are the various sites for the bone marrow examination. We have posterior iliac crest, we have anterior iliac crest and we have sternum. So how is anterior iliac crest? Anterior iliac crest has thick hard cortical layer of, anterior, uh, uh, of bone which makes satisfactory uh, specimens very difficult to obtain. And uh, needle can also uh, enter the peritoneal cavity, so there is also slight danger to that. And it has also been reported to be slightly more painful. So uh, although it is not a very bad site, but uh, it is definitely uh, not preferred over the posterior iliac crest. What about sternum? Sternum should be done only in adolescents and uh, adults, not in children. And where in sternum, the first part of the body of the sternum, that is a preferred site, or lower part of the manubrium. Very important thing for doing sternal aspirates is that after piercing the skin and subcutaneous tissue, when the needle point uh, reaches the periosteum, we have to adjust the guard of the needle to allow it to penetrate only about 5 mm further and not beyond, because there is a high risk of complications for sternal aspirates. Remember, bone marrow biopsy should never be done from the sternum. What about TBR? Marrow aspiration from the anteromedial surface of the TBI is performed only in children less than 18 months of age. I have never performed a TBL uh, aspirate, anterior iliac crest and sternum is something that I have done. And the sternum is uh, something that is very useful in certain conditions. Especially in conditions where you have a, very, a lot of fibrosis in the posterior iliac crest and you are not getting the uh, cells that you require for say flow cytometric examination or a cytogenetic examination. If you need those cells, maybe even go ahead with the sternal uh, aspirate and the aspirate becomes uh, is usually much better there. Fibrosis is much lower in the sternum. Okay, now positioning of the patient.
राइट और लेफ्ट लैटर लिखे बट विथ नीस फ्लेक्सड और इट कैन ऑल्सो बी डन इन प्रोन पोजिशन Uh, we prefer prone position here, but I have seen a lot of people who are much more comfortable with the lateral decubitus, and both are equally good. Uh, for anterior iliac rest, of course, the patient has to be in the supine position with hips and knees flexed and eyes away, and for sternum, again supine position with head and eye away and a light sheet covering the face. Skin preparation: the skin surrounding side should be clean. Uh, they should be cleaned by using a sterile gauze soaked in 10 percent covered in iodine solution, and wash the skin in circular motion beginning at the mark point and work outwards, and remove the iodine from center uh, of the area by a sterile isopropyl alcohol soaked gauze, and place a drain over the pigment site. So this is how uh, it is done. Uh, you can see that we are beginning at the center of the area, and we move to the outside. We always have to move from the center to the outside once the iodine uh, has been. Uh, The, the site has been covered with powder and iodine. Then it has to be cleaned with uh, alcohol. Now, administering local anesthesia. A local anesthetic is used to numb the skin and periosteum at the site of marrow procurement. 10 ml syringe filled with 1% lignocaine uh, is usually used. Uh, it is suggested that 26 gauge, uh, 26 g needles should be uh, used to inject a small amount of ligno uh, of the LA intradermally. To produce a wheel, and after that, a 22 g needle should be used to push through the skin and subcutaneous tissue, and thus uh, until the surface of the periosteum is encountered. However, this is not really practical, and most places use only a 22 g needle first to form the, uh, the wheel near the skin, and then to go it through the skin into the subcutaneous tissue and on the surface of the periosteum. Uh, a, a good thing to do here is that the thickness and the depth of the periosteum is assessed using this needle before doing the uh, doing the aspirate, so you you know how the bone feels. So here you can see after clearing the uh, lignocaine filled uh, needle is uh, the syringe is being uh, given to the patient, and here the uh, the person who is doing the procedure is also trying to feel the bone through the needle. Now, two to five ml of lignocaine is used to anesthetize a roughly circular area of the periosteum. Spinal needle is sometimes used. This is, this is also something uh, that might be used in uh, obese patients where the needle, uh, the site is actually too far and can't be reached with a normal needle. Spinal needle may be uh, required. And the adequacy of the local anesthesia can be determined by gently probing the periosteum with sharp point to the needle to make certain that no sensitive areas remain. So at the end, before removing uh, your uh, local anesthesia, just tap around with the needle to see if the patient has any pain. If there is any pain, just put some more uh, local anesthesia in that case. And alternative local anesthetics, uh, if lignocaine is uh, the patient's hypersensitive to lignocaine, is chloroprocaine and bupivacaine. You should always remember that an emergency crash cart should always be ready with airway injectable epinephrine and hydrocortisone, and it should be kept ready for immediate use in case of any issues. So these are the various boner aspirate needles that are available in the market: the Klima needle, the Sala boner aspirate needle, uh, the Waterfield uh, iliac crest boner needle, and the modern Jamshidi aspirate needle as well. What we are using here, uh, here most commonly is the Sala needle. You can see the trocar, the cannula, and the guard. This is the guard that should be placed at the tip uh, while doing the sternal aspirate. And you can see the number written in the 18 gauge. This is for pediatric boner aspirates. A 16 g uh, Sala needle is usually used. For an adult, right? So we're now going on to the technique. The aspiration needle is obtained uh, from its cover in a sterile manner. It is held horizontally for a patient in the lateral lateral decubitus, and vertically if the uh, if it is prone or supine position, with the index finger near the tip of the needle to control the depth of penetration. Or the needle is advanced slowly with steady pressure and slight twisting motion through the anesthetized skin, through the center of the wheel to the periosteum. And the aspirated needle, uh, aspirate needle, is gently advanced through cortical bone by rotation and steady forward pressure. So here you can see the uh, person is holding on the needle and slowly putting it through circular motions inside the skin and again into the through the periosteum into the marrow cavity. A sensation of decreased resistance usually indicated uh, penetration of cortex and entry of needle into the spongy cancellous bone. When there is this uh, giveaway feeling or a feeling of decreased resistance, the needle is further advanced another one centimeter into the marrow cavity, and the stylet is unlocked and removed. Now, a 20 ml syringe is uh, attached. The patient is warned of a possible unpleasant sensation 
when the plunger of the syringe is pulled back and small amount that's only around 0.3 ml of the bone marrow has to be aspirated you can see here that the aspirate has reached only the hub of the syringe and only this much is uh, required if more than this is taken there will be hemodilution so after this the syringe is quickly handed over to for the smear preparation and another syringe is attached for marrow for the other tests uh, uh, that are required for example for flow cytometry or molecular tests or any other tests that are required so first you take out this uh, smear uh, this 0.3 ml makes lights and then add another syringe to it and uh, then uh, take out the remaining samples. If no material is aspirated, for example in dry taps, we have to insert the needle further and try again, maybe move around the direction of the needle a bit and then try again and a lot of times, uh, especially in acute leukemias where the marrow is really packed, if you probe a little, this, uh, the aspirate comes. So as soon as the aspirate, as soon as we uh, see that this uh, syringe has 0.3 ml or just up to the hub, we now take it to the slides, you can see that there are two slides that are placed in a slanting position on the table, we put on the aspirate uh, onto this uh, slide, the slant slides and wait for some time. Here uh, jokingly these slides are called as goal posts where we put on the bone marrow aspirate and then when some of the blood starts dripping off, you collect the particles and then you make the smears. You collect the particles from this slide and you uh, put them on onto the smear making. Other than that, we have other samples that you have taken. For example, we can take irritia samples for bone marrow aspirate, sorry, for flow cytometry, for molecular tests, and we take heparin samples for fish or uh, cytogenetic studies. Now, bone marrow aspirate, uh, aspirate smear preparation. Smear should be immediately prepared at bedside from the first aspirate sample, that is the first pull. Now, traditional wedge technique, a drop of aspirated material is placed on one end of a clean slide and a second slide is used to, as a spreader held at a 30 degree uh, and a spreader slide held in front of a drop, moved back till it presses the drop and liquid spreads across the edge of the slide and then pushed forward in a rapid swift, uh, swift movement just like we do for the peripheral uh, blood and a particle rich feathered edge smear is prepared. Now, let's go to the first statement where we say that the smear should be pre immediately prepared at bedside from the first aspirated sample or the first pull. This is true in most cases. However, in certain cases where you have a specific purpose for your bone marrow examination, this might not be true. For example, when you are doing a minimal residual disease uh, uh, study uh, in post-therapy uh, acute leukemia cases, then you need your flow cytometry sample to be as good as possible and there it is advised that you put your first pull for your flow cytometry examination and then your uh, uh, maybe a slightly diluted uh, sample for your slide preparation because here the slide preparation is not that essential for the report but the medical visual disease report from the flow cytometry is really really essential. Similarly sometimes cytogenetic examination or fish might be the first priority and then the first pool should be given to the uh, heparin sample. So this is how the slides are prepared, make as many slides as possible, at least 5 slides and more if uh, possible and then uh, some, some, in some places cosh smears are also prepared, this is how they look but uh, for examination the wedge smear are uh, possibly the best because they have these areas that go or the particles that go onto the edge of the slide and then there are these areas or the trails that are uh, just behind the particles which are very good for cellular examination. Now, after the procedure is over, the, uh, the person who is doing the procedure is applying pressure because sometimes there, there might be some oozing of blood after the procedure is over. To prevent that, if you just put pressure uh, uh, on the side, this bleeding will stop and then the, that will uh, help in stopping the bleeding. Uh, you must remember that there is no absolute contraindication for a bone marrow examination. Uh, patients with platelets as low as 5000 or even lower we can go ahead and do a bone marrow examination in them. However, we must remember that in these patients, there might be prolonged bleeding and you might require to put pressure there at the site for maybe one minute, two minutes, but then after that, bleeding will definitely stop and then you can uh, go ahead, you can uh, put some tincture there and then cover it with a nice bandage. After the procedure, before uh, letting the patient go, it is very important to ask if the patient is feeling okay inform patient of probable time taken for report availability, advise the, uh, of, advise the patient to take paracetamols or NSAIDs, 
if there is pain at the procedure site and advise the patient to meet a physician if any discomfort or feeling of unease happens uh, subsequently. So now that we have covered how the bone marrow examination has been done, let's now move on to what is uh, to be done by, uh, for evaluation of the bone marrow. So uh, before moving on to bone marrow uh, morphology assessment, again we have to remember very importantly that the patient history, recent lab data and past specimen has to be uh, taken and the examination of peripheral blood has to be done. No bone marrow evaluation should be done without a proper history or a proper peripheral blood examination. This is more important in labs where the, uh, the pathologist himself or herself is not doing the procedure. So we do not have the data, we might not have the data at the time of the bone marrow examination. But uh, during the time of uh, assessment, we should always insist that we get as much data as possible so that we can correlate the findings very well. Now, uh, going on to the adequacy of the bone marrow aspirate sample. It is difficult to have an objective criteria for adequacy in bone marrow aspirate. At the time of the procedure, uh, the presence of marrow particles in the aspirate is the best indicator that the needle entered the medullary cavity and the marrow was su su successfully withdrawn. Now, it is uh, difficult to have an objective criteria for bone marrow aspirates because this is in uh, co contrast to bone marrow, asp uh, bone marrow biopsies where we know that the length of the biopsy or the number of uh, intradermal spaces that we see in the biopsy uh, are used to define the adequacy. Here, it is slightly more difficult. Marrow particles are bony uh, with glistening appearance caused by flat fat in the particles. So, while making the smears, this is what we have to look for to identify these. And importantly, the bone marrow aspirate should contain several particles, each with a trail of well-stained, morphologically distinct bone marrow cells. Now, coming on to systematically approaching a bone marrow film. So, now a film has uh, a bone marrow stained bone marrow film has come to you. What should we do? First, go to the low power. As for any uh, pathology slide, we first go to the low power. And what is should we look for in the low power in a bone marrow spirit? First thing is to determine the cellularity. We try and determine the cellularity by examining several particles. Then, megacamocytes can be identified and their morphology and maturation sequence can be noted. Then, we have to look for clumps of abnormal cells that could indicate infiltration by metastatic tumor and identify macrophages. So, cellularity, megacamocytes, abnormal cells and macrophages these are the four things that we have to look for in low power while we are uh, looking at a bone marrow aspirate film. Why do I say this? Very clearly, you can see this picture. This is a scanning power actually, not even a low power, just 4x. And you can see that here, the only identifiable things are a bone marrow aspirate and a megacarocyte. Rest all of these are small tiny dots and nothing can be uh, examined here. Coming on to the cellularity. So what is cellularity? It is a measurement of the ratio of hematopoietic cells to fat. Now we know that at birth, marrow space is entirely filled with hematopoietic uh, tissue, but with aging, there is gradual decrease in the cellularity. Why is there this gradual decrease in cellularity? This is caused by a loss of hematopoietic tissue. There is a reduction in the number of osteoblastic progenitors, and there is also a reduction in the amount of bone. This is also a very important factor which we uh, come to know because in patients with osteoporosis, this effect can be so great that even young persons who are hematologically normal, but since they have osteoporosis, they, uh, there is a reduction in the amount of bone. So even young uh, persons can have as low as 20% of their marrow cavity occupied by hematopoietic cells. So this is very important to remember. There is also, along with this, a corresponding increase in the amount of adipose tissue which fills the non-hematopoietic marrow space and there is an accelerated rate of decline above the age of 70 years. So you can see this graph where you can see there is gradual decline in the early uh, part of the life uh, of the bone marrow cellularity with age but from the range of 30 to 60 years there is almost a plateau. So the, uh, it really does not decrease that fast but after the age of 70 years you can see this there is this marked decline. Can I just come in a bit, if you don't mind? There is a feedback from the YouTube uh, to go a bit slow. They are not able to follow. Okay. Sorry yes. for that. No, no problem at all. Right. Right. So, if we uh, will look at cellularity, uh, let's start with cellularity again. So, cellularity is the measurement of the ratio of hematopoietic cells to fat. Uh, we know that at birth, the marrow space is nearly entirely filled with active hematopoietic tissue. And with aging, there is a gradual decrease in the cellularity. 
The reasons for this decrease in cell length is loss of hematopoietic tissue, a reduction in the number of osteoblastic progenitors, and a reduction in the amount of bone which can be seen in subjects with osteoporosis. If, who, even young patients with osteoporosis can have very little bone marrow because there is a reduction in the amount of bone as such. Uh, along with this, there is also a corresponding increase in the amount of fat and there is accelerated rate of decline as we see in the following graph. There is an accelerated rate of decline of the bone marrow cellularity after 70 years following a near plateau in the range of 30 to 70 years. So, we had come to what is normal cellularity? Is there something as a normal cellularity? So, a formula of 100 minus age is something that is commonly used to say what is uh, what a normal cellularity of a uh, uh, bone marrow should be at a particular age. But we have to remember that there are multiple variables which affect bone marrow cellularity and the most important uh, factor of it is the site of bone marrow examination. This might sound surprising, but you can see this graph where A and B are Anterior, uh, the bone marrow cellularity from anterior superior iliac spine of two different studies. Uh, C is the sternal aspirate and D is the anterior superior, so sorry, A and B were the posterior superior iliac spine, D is anterior and C is the sternal aspirate. And you can see that there is variation in the cellularity depending on the site from which the bone marrow has been performed. So we can say that a normal middle-aged individual will have approximately 50% cells and 50% fat. So 25 to 75% cellularity is considered to be normal in individuals who are 20 to 70 years of age. So we can take the caveat that except in extremely old age, cellularity less than 20% indicates hypoplasia and except in those who are less than 20 years of age, cellularity of more than 80% is likely to indicate hyperplasia. But again, we have to remember that bone marrow biopsy is the gold standard for assessing the cellularity. Now, there are certain caveats in cellularity assessment from bone marrow aspirate because we know that bone marrow biopsy is the gold standard. What are these caveats that we should follow if we have only a bone marrow aspirate for assessment of cellularity? So the cellularity of fragments or the marrow particles is of more importance than the cellularity of trails. So these particles are actually like mini biopsies and con contain sufficient hematopoietic and fatty elements to give some idea of marrow cellularity. Occasionally, however, it must be noted that the presence of quite cellular trails despite hypocellular fragments suggests that the marrow cellularity is adequate. And also, because of the variability of cellularity from one intertabular space to the next, it is not possible to assess marrow cellularity if only a few fragments are aspirated. So it is very important that you should, uh, you should assess multiple fragments to assess the cellularity. Now let's take some examples. Here we can see that there is predominantly fat in this bone marrow aspirate, uh, aspirate particle and very few cellularity. And also in the trails we can see that almost no cells are there. So here if the patient is a middle aged patient or say a 20 year old patient, we can comfortably say that for this 20 year or 25 year old patient, this is a hypocellular bone marrow aspirate. In contrast, if we say that this bone marrow aspirate, we can see only cells and very, very little fat. So for this uh, patient, if, it, if this patient is uh, say 25 year old, we can comfortably say that this patient has hypercellular uh, bone marrow because we can see uh, the aspirate particle which is filled with cells and we can also see that these trails are also filled with cells. So hypercellularity is definitely here. So we don't have any uh, doubts in, the, uh, in these kind of particles. But what about this? Here we can see that the cellularity in the particle is not that much. There are quite a lot of fat, but we also see that there is a lot of uh, cells in the uh, in the trails. A lot of cellularity is present. If we go into the trails, however, we see that they can, we can see mast cells as well. We can see a lot of lymphocytes, we can see plasma cells. So what exactly is this? This was a 20, 20 year old patient who had complaints of cytopenias and the clinicians were thinking that it, this could be a plastic anemia. Uh, but this uh, uh, still, this aspirate uh, particle is not exactly that uh, hypocellular as you would expect, like for example this. So we have to do a bone marrow biopsy in uh, these uh, situations and see that the bone marrow biopsy is actually completely hypocellular. So how did we get this particle? So if you look at the bilateral biopsies, we can see that there is this area which is actually quite cellular 
and we can also see hemorrhage in this area. So this is probably the area of the bone marrow, uh, bone marrow from where the aspirate was taken. A lot of cells came along with it and that's why we were fooled into thinking that is probably not a hypocellular or a aplastic anemia but in fact the bone marrow biopsy revealed that actually a very hypocellular bone marrow. That is why you can understand why bone marrow biopsy is much more preferable over bone marrow aspirates for uh, cellularity assessment. However, if we have enough particles and if we assess enough particles properly, even bone marrow aspirate is not a very bad sample for cellularity assessment. Hemodilution is a big problem. So, hemodilution affects interpretation of bone marrow cellularity on aspirate smears. The adult marrows with greater than 30% lymphocytes plus monocytes are likely to be substantially uh, admixed with blood. Similarly, a higher than expected proportion of mature neutrophils in the marrow is another clue to the hemodilated bone marrow aspirate. So, a substantial dilution with the bone marrow may occur if aspirates uh, or when uh, multiple draws are taken from the same puncture site. So, as we saw uh, earlier while doing the bone marrow procedure, when we take only around 0.3 ml initially and then we take subsequent samples, the subsequent samples are always uh, hemodiluted. So, initially if we take, uh, instead of 0.3, if we take just, uh, say 1 ml samples, even that will be hemodiluted. And that can affect our assessment of cellularity in the bone marrow aspirate. Okay, so now moving from cellularity, the other thing that we will look for in the uh, low power are megakaryocytes. So, megakaryocytes are large cells, around 30 to 160 micron large and they are visible in scanning on low power. There is a marked degree of heterogeneity in both the nuclear DNA content, which is very surprising, and nuclear size of the megakaryocytes. Now, why is there a heterogeneity in the nuclear content of megakaryocytes? That is because these megakaryocytes, they undergo a special type of cell division called as endoreduplication, where a cell undergoes a series of mitosis without actual cell division. So, the ploidy levels in the mature uh, megakaryocytes are variable, they range from 4N to 32N, which is very uh, strange for our human body because we know that most cells in our human bodies are deployed, that is 2N. 16N megs are most commonly found in bone marrow. Sometimes some huge and large megakaryocytes can even be 64, have 64N or 128N, so very large, uh, very uh, increased amount of DNA content. How are these megakaryocytes classified? They can be group 1 megakaryocytes or the megakaryocyte blast, which are small in size, 15 to 20 microns, and they have round to slightly lobulated nuclei and scant amount of deeply visible cytoplasm and high NC ratio. Group 2 megakaryocytes are uh, slightly larger, which have finely visible uh, granular cytoplasm. So we can see this cell in the center is a cell of the megakaryocyte series, very small, basophilic cytoplasm. Uh, and a deep singly lobated nucleus. This is probably the uh, meg, the group one. And here you can see this is slightly larger than that, but we, it is mostly deep basophilic cytoplasm, and there is some amount of uh, granularity uh, in, the, in the cytoplasm as well. These are the group two. So what are group three megakaryocytes? The group three megakaryocytes are the mature megakaryocytes. Their ploidy level are four n to sixty four n, as we had dis uh, discussed. And these are the largest hematopoietic cells in the body. And uh, they have a volume of approximately 15,000 femtoliters. They are multilobulated, cerebriform nucleus, and have plentiful weak basophilic cytoplasm and contain abundant azurophilic granules. The nuclei of a great majority of normal uh, polypoid uh, megakaryocytes form irregular lobes joined by strands of chromatin. And uh, this is how uh, basically a mature megakaryocyte looks. You can see this huge in size. A lot of normal um, hematopoietic elements can be fitted into this single megakaryocyte. But we must also remember that the final stage, megakaryocyte maturation, so uh, we get an apparently bare nucleus, which is actually a very thin cytoplasmic rim because the great bulk of the cytoplasmic has been shed off already as platelets. So this is also a stage that can be seen sometimes in the bone marrow aspirate. Now how do you assess these megakaryocytes? It's necessary to assess megakaryocyte numbers as well as morphology. So uh, for numbers and morphology, there's, it's a subjective assessment. We can't really say that uh, exactly that the megakaryocytes are adequate or inadequate. Subjectively we can say that they are decreased, normal or increased. Some people take 3 to 5 megakaryocytes around a particle to be adequate, but this can be very variable, especially in the scenario where you have hemodilution. So, somewhat fewer megakaryocytes are seen in sections of aspirate fragments than in trifine biopsies. So, this is very important to note 
that the fine biopsies will have more number of megacarocytes compared to aspirate and, uh, bone marrow aspirates. This is possibly because these large cells are not as readily aspirated as the smaller marrow cells. So the megacarocytes in the bone marrow aspirates will always be slightly lesser than in the bone marrow biopsies. So there is a very important table from that I've taken from WHO which shows why megacarocyte morphology and assessment is uh, important and especially important in the myeloproliferative neoplasms. We can see the various myeloproliferative neoplasms here, the polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia and the uh, PMF, the two stages of uh, primary myelofibrosis. We can see the increase in quantity is really pronounced in ET. We can see the giant megacarocytes are uh, also present in ET. We can see the dense clusters of megacarocytes are found in uh, primary myelofibrosis and hyperlobation or staghorn like megacarocytes are seen both in ET and in polycythemia vera and maturation defects are noted in uh, primary myelofibrosis. So megacarocyte morphology is very very important to differentiate between uh, the myeloproliferative neoplasms. However, we know that in today's uh, age of uh, molecular genetics, these only play a supportive role. What is dysmegacarocytes? So, megacarocytes dysplasia is characterized by micromegacarocytes, non-lobated nuclei in megacarocytes of all sizes and multiple widely separated nuclei. So, a dysmegacarocytes uh, as described by WHO has micromegacarocytes, nuclear hypolobation and multinucleation which is basically lobe separated nuclei. These can be seen in the various myelodysplastic syndromes and they can also be seen in the various MDS MPNs. We are not going into the detail of the various diseases, we are just looking at the approach. So here you can see this smear has a lot of uh, megacarocytes and this section has one mature appearing megacarocyte and three very deeply basophilic, so probably immature megacarocytes. This is uh, a patient which had uh, uh, which was suspected to have immune thrombocytopenia and the bone marrow was done and we can see this increase in megacarocytes along with an increase of immature megacarocytes as seen in uh, immune thrombocytopenia. However, we must remember here that bone marrow examination is not really indicated in, uh, uh, in suspected ITP cases except in certain scenarios. ITPs can very readily be uh, diagnosed if a patient has low platelets and you give the patient steroids and the patient responds to steroids and the patient's platelets increase, we can say that the patient really has ITP. We don't really need to do a bone marrow for that. However, if the patient is elderly and you're suspecting ITP in an elderly, in that situation marrow is uh, suggested because it, the differential diagnosis for ITP at that age in an elderly patient becomes a myelodysplastic syndrome and we really need to uh, look at the morphology there to rule out myelodysplastic syndromes. Here we can see another slide, we can see this deeply lobated megacarocyte, I think we have a higher power image, you can see large lobations, this is a patient who had a platelet of around 16 lakhs and uh, we diagnosed this patient as uh, essential thrombocythemia and you can see how deeply lobated and large these megacarocytes can become sometimes. Uh, uh, the, the ploidy in these uh, cells would be huge, there would be 64 and or 128 n. Here we can see some nice dysmyocarabotic cells, these cells which have separated, lobe separated nuclei. This is what is called as a pawn ball appearance of megacarocytes. Uh, you can see uh, three or four of these nuclei here. Again, if we get this kind of uh, megacarocyte which has a hypolobated single nucleus and the patient has the complaint of anemia, this is very highly suggestive of an MDS with 5Q deletion. So we can get clues as to what disease there might be by looking at the megacarocyte morphology. We can here also see these certain small megacarocytes will do not really have a nuclear lobation, but we can see that the cytoplasm is really mature because it has dense granular and it's ready to shut off the platelets. However, with this much uh, maturity of the cytoplasm, then the cell size should have been much bigger. The nucleus should have been much bigger. This is also a type of dysplasia. Right. So we move on from the megacarocytes, we can look at the histocytes as well in the low power. So histocytes are larger cells uh, with oval or kidney shaped nuclei and variable amount of hydroblasm that may contain granules, vacuoles, cellular debris and hemosiderin. They are a part of the reticular endothelial systems and they also serve as a uh, major marrow uh, site for iron storage and play a critical role as nursing cells for erythropoiesis. But they also have uh, implications in disease. So here we can see these uh, 
histiocytes, they are engulfing a lot of these erythroid precursors and also platelet. Yes. So, in a patient who has complaints of cytopenias and uh, the patient is very sick, the uh, diagnosis of HLH can be made and you can see that the hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow or spleen or lymph nodes is only one of the criteria for uh, HLH diagnosis. The HLH can be diagnosed uh, on the basis of either molecular diagnosis or a secondary HLH in which five of the eight criteria uh, need to be fulfilled and hemophagocytosis is only one of the eight criteria. So the point I'm arriving at here is that hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow need not be present for a patient to be diagnosed with HLH if the other uh, findings are there. However, if the other findings are already there, for example, if the patient's fibrinogen is low and if the patient has high ferritin and there are cytopenias and, uh, and uh, organomegalies, the finding of this kind of hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow is really very highly indicative of uh, an HLH and we should inform the clinicians very very quickly so that they can initiate treatment for these patients. This another kind of cell that can be seen uh, in the uh, bone marrow. These are storage cell, gaseous cells. These are also histocytes that can be uh, found in uh, low power and various other uh, storage cells can also be seen. And this is something that is called as a sea blue histocyte. The C blue histocytes or pseudo gaseous cells can be seen in various states of myeloproliferation. So when there is a lot of bone marrow uh, cell, cellular production, so the cellular turnover of the bone marrow increases. So the normal role of the histocyte is to engulf these cells. And when it is engulfing a lot of cells, changes happen to the cytoplasm and we can see such kind of C blue histocytes or pseudo gaseous cells as well. So that covers the histocytes. And next we move on to some other cells we can, which we can see from low power, which is the bone marrow mats. In the, uh, bone marrow mats, because they are usually present in groups and clusters, hence they are very easy to visualize on low power screening of the bone marrow aspirate. This was a study uh, published in uh, 2018 where they showed that gastric cancer was the most common primary tumor uh, followed by breast and unknown origin and lung and prostate and neuroblastoma. However, this, uh, this does not, did not include uh, pediatric patients and uh, if the pediatric patients uh, are, only perform, are only taken, neuroblastoma is one of the major causes of bone marrow metastasis that we see in our center. So here is a scanner view, you can see that there is a scanner view and there is a 10 power, uh, 10, uh, power of uh, 10x and even in these powers we can see these groups which appear slightly abnormal and as we go in, we can see that there are these group, groups of uh, cells which are arranged in a somewhat assigned pattern. And this was a case of CA breast which has bone marrow infiltration. This is another case again where you can see these large groups and clumps on scanning power. And this is again, this forms some kind of uh, an SNI, but this was basically uh, a neuroblastoma which had infiltrated into the bone marrow. Other than these cells, we also have osteoclasts and osteoblasts that we can see in the low power. And uh, here we can see an osteoclast and uh, here we can see an osteoblast. So osteoclasts are basically multinuclear giant cells with a diameter of 30 to 100 micrometer microns or size. Their nuclei tend to be clearly separate and they have voluminous cytoplasm which contains numerous azelophilic granules which are coarser than those of the megakaryocytes and they are commonly seen in the bone marrow aspirate of children but infrequently in adults. Okay. With that, we move away from the uh, low power and we have seen the cells that we can see on low power and make an uh, assessment of what exactly can be the issue in the bone marrow by looking at the low power. After that, we move on to the high power. So how do we see, uh, what all things do we have to see in a high power? So in high power, we have to firstly identify all cells of maturation of uh, the myeloid and erythroid cells and determine the MA ratio. This has to be followed by a uh, by, uh, uh, by performance of a differential count, which uses the uh, categories the erythroid, myeloid, lymphoid, plasma cell, and others, and simultaneously noting any morphological abnormalities. Then we have to look for areas of bone marrow necrosis, and also assess the iron content, especially in the pearl stain. So basically, when we are going to the high power, we have looked at the uh, uh, we have already looked at the uh, cellularity, we have already looked at the megakaryocytes. So now we look at the other cells, the normal myeloid and the erythroid cells, also the lymphocytes and that's what we have to assess in the high power. So what is the ME ratio? The ME ratio is an important semi-quantitative measurement of red and white blood cell development. Now ME ratio along with assessment of cellularity, it allows an assessment of whether erythropoiesis or granulopoiesis are hypoplastic 
normal or hyperplastic so you have to remember this that ma ratio along with cell assessment of cellularity is very important ma ratio alone will not be of much help as i will show you in a subsequent slides so ma ratio is basically determined by dividing the proportion of cells in the myeloid series by the proportion of erythroblasts what is the normal ma ratio up to 20 years of age it is usually 1 is to 1 to 5 uh, 5 is to 1 and over 20 uh, years of age in males it is 1.1 is to 1 to 4.1 is to 1 it is slightly higher in females 1.6 is to 1 to 5.2 is to 1 uh, and increased ma ratio indicates granulocytic hyperplasia or a decreased erythropoiesis again depending on cellularity as we said and a decreased ma ratio can be interpreted as either myeloid hypocellularity or erythroid hyperplasia again depending on the overall marrow cellularity so let's take some examples here you can see there is a lot of erythroid hyperplasia if we take a closer look we can see a lot of erythroid cells here this is a post uh, induction bone marrow so it is a patient of acute lymphoblastic leukemia he underwent 28 days of induction chemotherapy and in during this induction chemotherapy the bone marrow as per the bone marrow the bone marrow becomes basically completely devoid of any cells because of the intense chemotherapy and then the bone marrow slowly starts to re regenerate so in this regenerating bone marrow we usually see a lot of erythroid uh, progenitors so erythroid hyperplasia is a very common finding in post uh, induction bone marrows of, of acute lymphoblastic leukemia now here here we can see in this slide there are a lot of myeloid cells and the erythroid cells are fewer so the ma ratio here would be around 7 is to 1 8 is to 1 maybe around 10 is to 1 so we definitely know that the patient has a high ma ratio but we also know that the cellularity of this uh, looking at the cellularity the cellularity of this myeloid is also high so with a high ma ratio there is a myeloid component being higher and the cellularity also being higher we can uh, assess that this high ma ratio is actually caused by myeloproliferation there is more proliferation of the myeloid series cell uh, as seen by the hypercellularity and the increase of the myeloid series in contrast here you can see this this smear which also has a lot of myeloid series and almost no erythroid series so here also your ma ratio will be very high the ma ratio will, might in fact here be higher than the one that we saw in the previous case but is the cellularity also high no the cellularity in this smear is actually not uh, too high it is actually low so what is really happening here so the high ma ratio in this case is not actually because of the proliferation of the myeloid series cell but it is because of the absence of the erythroid series cell which is skewing the ma ratio towards the higher ma ratio and here we see that this uh, high ma ratio is actually caused by paucity of erythroid precursors and this patient has a pure red cell aplasia so now uh, after uh, looking at the various aspects of ma ratio we come on to the differential counts uh, the differential count is performed by determining the percentage of various marrow cell types on a well stained and technically adequate aspirate smear using a manual or electronic differential cell counter depending on the desired accuracy of the differential count a total of 100 200 500 or 1000 cells may be examined so it will completely depend on two things one how much is the cellularity and two uh what what kind of disease is it so if it is a patchy disease for example if it is a, uh, if it is say a multiple myeloma you know that the plasma cells can be present in various parts of the uh, bone marrow so it is very essential to uh, count uh, cells uh, along different aspirate uh, particles in different part of the bone marrow smears and we, because of that we also need to count higher number of cells however in a case of aplastic anemia we know that the number of cells will be very low so counting of 100 cells will actually suffice so counts are compared with normal values and the total cellularity of a specimen to determine whether cell whether any cell line is increased that is hyperplastic or decreased that is hypoplastic the cell count should be performed in the trails behind fragments so that the cells counted represent cells that have come from fragments rather than contaminating the peripheral uh, than the contaminating peripheral blood cells so this is very important that the counting should be done just behind the cell uh, the trails of the fragments that is where the least modulation has happened uh, barbara bean says that a 500 cell count provides a reasonable compromise between what is desirable and what is practicable uh, uh, a 200 cell count in many scenarios can also be uh, very very really, uh, reasonable Uh, because some cells, uh, for example, plasma cells, as we are discussing, and lymphocytes are distributed unevenly throughout the bone marrow. It is important to count the trails behind several fragments uh, that we are that are present in the bone marrow aspirate. So this is a table from the Williams Hematology 
which gives uh, the uh, different ranges of the various components of the uh, myelogram that is the promyelocytes, the myelocytes, the metamyelocytes, segmented neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, etc. And we have to compare our counts with these normal uh, counts. This is the table from uh, Barbara Wayne, which also gives the similar findings. And we have to compare our findings with uh, the known uh, normals, and then we have to assess whether a particular cell type is increased or decreased or not. Coming on to erythropoiesis, we know that erythropoiesis, erythroblasts are uh, the precursors of uh, red cells. And a very important concept here is that the term normoblasts is often used interchangeably with erythroblast. We can say that it's a late uh, early erythroblast or late normoblast, uh, late erythroblast. We also often say it's early normoblast or late normoblast. But normoblast has a, no a narrower meaning. Normoblast is applicable only when the erythropoiesis is normoblastic and not, not anywhere else. So using the term erythroblast is much more preferable and we know that the common erythro or the granulocytic precursor gives rise to proerythroblast from where it goes on to the early, intermediate and late erythroblast and the polychromatic, uh, uh, polychromatic erythrocyte which is basically the reticulocyte and goes on to the mature erythrocyte. The early, because of the basophilic uh, erythroblast is also called as the basophilic erythroblast and the intermediate is also called as the early polychromatophilic erythroblast and the late is also called as the late polychromatophilic uh, erythroblast. The term orthochromatic should not be used in uh, the context of a late erythroblast and is better avoided. I'll tell you why. So let's now go into the descriptions of the various cell types. We, uh, this, this is something that can be uh, studied from any textbook. So uh, we know that there are poro erythroblasts, there are early erythroblasts, mature on to the intermediate and into the uh, late erythroblasts. The late erythroblasts are incapable of cell division and the cytoplasm is only weakly mesophilic and in addition has a pink tinge due to the increased amount of hemoglobin and they extrude their nuclei to form polychromatophilic erythrocytes and uh, they are identified as uh, reticulocytes by supravital states. So we have to also remember that a small number of normal erythroblasts also show atypical morphological features such as irregular nuclei, binuclearity and cytoplasmic bridging between adjacent erythroblasts. But this does not mean that they are abnormal. If only a significant amount of erythroblasts have, are showing abnormalities, only then do we call them as abnormal. So what is megaloblastic maturation? So, the presence of megaloblasts, that is large cells with chromatin pattern more primitive than is appropriate for the age or the degree of maturation of the cytoplasm, uh, constitutes megaloblastosis. So, there is nuclear cytoplasmic asynchrony. So, the late megaloblasts are fully hemoglobinized and lack any cytoplasmic basophilia. And that is why the term orthochromatic, which can, uh, can be used for late megaloblasts, but it is a term which is not really appropriate in describing late normal uh, late normal blasts so the term orthochromatic uh, erythroblast should be left only for the megaloblasts and not for the normal blasts erythropoiesis is ineffective so that early erythroid cells are overrepresented in comparison with mature cells so whenever there is megaloblastic maturation we have more of the early erythro erythroblasts compared to the later ones here is a picture of a, a case that we had recently uh, which showed marked megaloblastosis. This is a patient which came with actually marked pancytopenia with a hemoglobin of just around 2 or 3 uh, TLC of just around uh, 1000 and platelets less than 10,000 and uh, uh, the bonar aspirate was done and this is what we found. We found uh, here also you can see the, the hemoglobinization has occurred and what is called the classic sieve-like chromatin very very immature looking chromatin with such a mature looking cytoplasm this nuclear uh, cytoplasmic asynchrony is very typical of megaloblastosis again dyserythropoiesis well, the features of dyserythropoiesis in red cells are nuclear and cytoplasmic in nuclear we have nuclear budding internuclear bridging cardiodexis multinuclearity megaloblastoid change in cytoplasmic it's a ring cytoplast baculation and very importantly pas positivity the erythroid precursors are usually PS negative, but if you see PS positivity in erythroid precursors, you can call it as uh, dyspoetic erythroid precursors or dyserythropoiesis. This, I feel, is one of the very important uses of periodic acid shift or the PS stain in bone marrow aspirate uh, smears. We know that the, the causes of dyserythropoiesis are they can be secondary to infections, we call folate deficiency, drugs, and many other causes. They can also be seen in congenital uh, uh, dyserythropoietic anemias or CDAs and the MDS and MDS MPNs. 
these are various morphological features of distal voices that we see in uh, various cases. And from uh, electrostatic results, we now move on to granulopoiesis. Granulopoiesis, again, we know from myeloblasts, we move on to promyelocytes, metamyelocytes, well, sorry, myelocytes, metamyelocytes, bad cells, and neutrophils. We don't really need to describe them in detail. Uh, but a common uh, abnormalities of granulocytic lineage that needs to be looked for in the bone marrow aspirate is whether there is increased granulopoiesis or not, which happens in the, in the MPN or an MPS MPN or an AML, or if there is a maturation arrest which can occur in congenital neutropenias or again the dyspoiesis or the grid dyspoiesis. Now this is the case that had come to us previously with marked uh, neutropenia and if you can see here, this is a very one year old kid, if you can see the granulocytic precursors only comprise these small cells which are basically pro-myelocytes. Uh, uh, this is maybe a promyelocyte is then maturing onto a myelocyte. So there can be some pro predominantly pro myelocytes, some myelocytes. There are uh, there is another myelocyte here. So there is basically uh, the maturation of the myeloid series lineage has stopped at the pro myelocyte and the myelocyte uh, cell. So there is maturation arrest, and this is what happens in congenital neutropenia. This kid had uh, severe congenital neutropenia. Here also we can see that there are a lot of eosinophils present. So this is, uh, we saw the, the maturation arrest and then we go on to dysgranulopoiesis. Again, the dysgranulopoiesis as described by WHO has smaller, can be of smaller, unusually large size. It can be nuclear hyposegmentation, that is pseudopalgorrhea formation, nuclear hypersegmentation, decreased granules, pseudogedia cleaviashi granules, dole body cell or rods. So here are various uh, dysgranulopoietic forms and we can see ring neutrophils which are rarely seen in uh, as dyspoetic forms but uh, when we can see them they are very very good indication that dyspoiesis is happening. What about monocytes? We know that monocytes uh, come from monoblasts to pro monocytes to monocytes and uh, monocytes and the bigger cells are actually quite infrequent among mole marrow cells because in contrast to mature neutrophils they are released rapidly into the peripheral blood rather than being stored in the bone marrow. Here is an example of a very classical um, um, monoblastic leukemia that we had recently, you can see this all these uh, blast-like cells with open up chromatin, abundant cytoplasm, these are all monoblasts and here we can see some of these cells also have uh, nuclear cleaving and uh, these are the pro-monocytes. I can show you another picture which has uh, these cells which are very very fine chromatin, abundant uh, amount of cytoplasm, light blue cytoplasm, finely vacuated cytoplasm, these are our pro-monocytes. And here is a myeloid blast along with the promonocyte in a case of a myeloma, uh, myelomonocytic leukemia. What about mast cells? Mast cells are derived from multipotent myeloid stem cells. They appear as oval or elongated cells and uh, they vary in size from 5 to 25 microns. The nucleus is central, relatively small and uh, either round or oval, but the cytoplasm is packed with granules which stain deep purple with Romanovsky stains. And, uh, a very important question that comes uh, in the mind of many uh, junior pathologists is what is the difference? How do you differentiate between mast cells and uh, basophils? So the answer to that is that actually the nuclear characteristics is what differentiates mast cells from basophils morphologically because mast cells do not have lobulated nucleus whereas the basophils have lobulated nucleus and there is less chromatin clumping in uh, the mast cells. So this is a case of an aplastic anemia, from the particle from the aplastic anemia where we can see increased mast cells here. So we see increased mast cells in aplastic anemias. This again you can see there, there are two uh, mast cells uh, lying in this case also had a lot of uh, mast cells uh, lying around. But here in this case we also see that there are a lot of lymphocytes. So this is basically a case of lymphoplasmacytic leukemia and we uh, lymphoma with bone marrow infiltration and we must remember that in lymphoplasmatic lymphomas a very good indication or very good hint that this is an LPL is that there is a marked mark proliferation of mast cells in these neoplasms. So lymphomas uh, which have a marked mast cell proliferation, LPLs are one of those. Other than that, of course, we have a huge spectrum of uh, mast cell uh, disorders which in, in themselves will have a lot of uh, proliferation of the mast cells. We move on to lymphocytes. So lymphocytes, we know that there are B and T lymphocytes, they share common origin with myeloid cells and the pluripotent stem cells and the bone marrow. 
where <coughs> mature and immature uh, contains mature and immature B cells, but only mature T cells because T cell maturation occurs in the thymus. So the immature T cells are actually found in the thymus, whereas <coughs> sorry, the uh, immature B cells are found in the bone marrow. But lymphocytes are not very numerous in the marrow. <coughs> Excuse me. Right. So, lymphocytes are actually not very numerous in the marrow in the first few days of life, but otherwise during infancy and childhood, they constitute almost a third to half the bone marrow nucleated cells. In adults, they usually do not uh, com comprise more than 15 to 25 percent of nucleated cells. So, here we can see a bone marrow which has a lot of uh, mature looking lymphocytes. This is basically a CLPD which has infiltrated into the bone marrow. So this is a bone marrow infiltration by a chronic lymphoproliferative disorder. This is what we have to see. However, here there is a caveat. One thing we have to remember that suppose a patient is uh, of a diffuse large B cell lymphoma and we are performing a bone marrow aspirate examination, a bone marrow examination to look for uh, infiltration. And if we see these kind of cells, small cells, so we should not think that there is no infiltration because the uh, primary site has diffuse large B cell lymphoma. That's a large, that's a large cell lymphoma. There can be discordant morphology. Discordant morphology is actually seen in almost 10 to 30 percent cases of DLB cells. And in such cases, the bone marrow will show only small mature looking lymphocytes and not the large lymphocytes that is present in the uh, primary site. From here, we move on to plasma cells. We know the plasma cells are infrequent in the bone marrow and clock phase chromatin, which is often discernible in histological sections, are usually less apparent in the film. And here we can see a case of a plasma cell proliferative disorder or multiple myeloma, which has a lot of plasma cells. We can see these uh, classical appearing plasma cells here. But we have to remember that this morphology might not always represent. Sometimes they have very, very atypical uh, present. Uh, morphology, you can see these very strange looking cells, these are all also plasma cells. Coming to storage iron, so bone marrow is a major uh, storage site for body iron, so the amount of stainable iron of the bone marrow is an accurate indication of bone body iron stores. Intracellular marrow iron is primarily in the form of hemocytin granules localized in macrophages and less within the blast, which are also called as the sideroblasts when they contain uh, iron. Now, individuals with very large quantities of bone marrow iron show numerous irregular yellow granular deposits of hemocytin on the macrophages that can be uh, appreciated without the pearl stain. However, smaller amounts of hemocytin cannot be visualized by light microscopy and must be detected by pearls fresh and blue reaction. So here is how the pearl stain is graded and here we can see absence of pearl stain and slowly uh, increased grading of pearl stain. So increase iron in the bone marrow aspirate. But well, we must remember that the pearl staining, the only purpose is not just to look for the uh, marrow stores, iron stores. We also have to look at the erythroid precursors and sometimes we find these wonderful findings of ring citroblasts where the erythroid precursors are surrounded by uh, these citrotic granules around the nucleus and this is uh, a sign of abnormal uh, uh, iron metabolism and can be seen in cytoplastic anemias and also in myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, now we come uh, come to the cytochemical stains that can be formed on the bone marrow spirit. This is a various uh, list of uh, cytochemical stains. Out of these, I feel myeloperoxidase is probably the most important stain that should be done in an era when uh, flow cytometric immunophenotyping is mostly performed on all bone marrow aspirates. So if you have a case of acute leukemia and if you are doing a bone marrow aspirate and you're also, uh, your center also has a uh, flow cytometer or you are going to send the bone marrow aspirate sample separately for a flow cytometer, myeloperoxidase stain or the MPO stain is still very helpful because a lot of times the myeloperoxidase can be positive on the bone marrow aspirate cytochemistry but be negative on the flow cytometry. This is because we are testing two different uh, properties of the MPO in the cytochemistry and on flow cytometry. In flow cytometry, we are just testing the antigenicity of the, uh, the of myeloperoxidase, whereas in cytochemical staining, when we are doing a cytochemistry, we are actually looking at the functionality of this MPO stain. So I feel MPO is one of the most important stains, uh, cytochemical stains that can be done on bone marrow aspirate. Other than that, a lab scoring can be done uh, for in cases of uh, CMLs, but that is not done on the bone marrow, it is done on the uh, peripheral blood. And PA stain. Now, PA stain, I feel, has slowly, uh, the significance of PA stain is slowly reducing, especially in the case of uh, acute leukemias, 
because uh, we, when we have to diagnose ALLs, you'll have to uh, look at the flow cytometry and can't diagnose these all based on cytochemistry in today's era. However, periodic acid shift still has some very important roles to play in, on the bone marrow spirit, one of, of which we saw earlier in the erythroid dyspoiesis, when we see that any erythroid precursor having PAS positivity is actually dysplastic, and also in diagnosis of uh, M6 or acute erythroid leukemia, where we see nice globular positivity in the blasts in, uh, for periodic acid shift. Here is a good example where you can see that the, these blasts are very small uh, and actually lymphoid looking blasts but when we perform the MPO stain we can actually see an or rod in these small looking blasts also. So MPO stain is actually very very helpful and with that we finally come <coughs> to what a bone marrow report should have. This again is the ICSH guideline uh, table which shows uh, what are the things that should be there in the bone marrow report. So, uh, not going into detail here, let's uh, show you what we uh, put in our report here in, uh, in PGI. <coughs> so, at the top we of course put the uh, patient identifiers like the name, age, sex, etc. And we also put the clinical impression that was there, that we uh, that was uh, put to, the question that was put to us while performing the bone marrow aspirate. So, is it a very plasma cell myeloma or whatever the clinical diagnosis was that we all, always put here. Then we go on to the hemogram details, we uh, give the hemoglobin, uh, the peripheral blood findings, we give the TLC, DLC and the reticulocyte count. After that we come to the bone marrow findings where we write about the particles, where it is particulate or not, how is the cellularity, we give the ME ratio, we also sometimes give the non erythroid to erythroid ratio which is very helpful sometimes in case of acute leukemia or CLPDs where the myeloid component is actually very low and the ME ratio will not really reflect the true nature of the bone marrow. So after that we go on and give the differential counts. So all the differential counts are mentioned. So we have blast two myelocytes, two uh, polymorphs, the lymphos, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils and plasma cells and any other cells. We go on to say uh, the erythropoiesis, uh, how the erythropoiesis is like, what is the thrombopoiesis like and any other kind of cell that we see in the bone marrow. We also go on to uh, say or talk about the uh, cytochemistry, whether uh, LAP was performed or MP or PS or pulse stain. And then we go on to the biopsy report and finally we give an interpretation along with the advice and of course the signing of physician's name should always be there. So with that I thank you for your kind listening. This is my department of hematology of which I am very proud to, be, proud to be a part of and thank you and I am glad to take any questions. Thank you so much. Very comprehensive, very detailed. And so. very nice. I think this, uh, like Dr. Vikrant Singh Bar has uh, commented from the YouTube, excellent talk, very basic but comprehensive, extremely useful to residents, even to practicing hematopathologists. A complete joy. Yes, indeed, a complete joy. Very, very nicely done up. Thank you so much. You really sir. worked hard in putting all these things together. Went one by one, systematically, uh, 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 you know, <clears throat> alluding to all these cells which we can see in the bone marrow, their importance. And finally, the final report, how we report and how a report should be. Just let us wait and see if there are any questions on the YouTube. Sure, sir. It just takes about 30 seconds, there's a delay. Right. I must also say that this is such a huge topic that I'm sure some things must have been missed here. I just tried to give a uh, basic outlook of all the things no, that you, uh, you have you have done complete justice you have done you have addressed all the things which are required because uh, as you you must be aware that we are in the process of this hematology process, uh, teaching program right. so in, in various specific areas you know all those areas will be highlighted otherwise this if you go on highlighting here this would go for three hours exactly yes yeah so you have exactly edited the, the presentation perfectly well very nicely done excellent Dr. Avinash Priyadarshani says, excellent talk, sir. Right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. There are no questions. Uh, uh, wonderful presentation, I would say. Excellently done. And uh, please share the PDF of this presentation. Right. And uh, we will share it with the, with the students. And uh, we will be back with you with the Trifine Biopsy, which is, again, something very basic and very important for all of us to learn. Thank you so much, Dr. Navjit Malik. Thank you so much for taking out time, Thanks. running back from your home to the office to, you know, to, to attend to and to take care of this. Thank you so much for your effort. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.
拜拜。